Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the writers' interviews for the Bull City International Film Festival. Today, I'm joined with Clint Ford, screenwriter for A Christmas Cheer. Say hi. Hi there. How are you? Good. Okay, so let's start off with like everybody's beginner question. How did it all start? How did you get into writing? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, okay, so I've always loved movies. I've loved movies and TV since I was a kid. And I mean, probably to the detriment of my grades and to the frustration of my parents. Um, yeah. But there were, gosh, I would say a lot of times where either A, I would watch something and say, gosh, I would have done it this way, or I wish they'd done it this way, or I loved the way they did it. And I'm like, gosh, you know, it'd be great if they would do this next. And I guess frustration got the better of me to where I was like, you know, what, I'm just going to write it. <laughs> and I, I, I wrote it down and, and started, you know, writing these ideas. And some of them were based on existing IPs, kind of like I did here with the uh, good old Ebenezer Scrooge mm -hmm. and some of them are my own uh, creations. Um, it's just so long as I, I know the characters back and forth, you know, to where they they live and breathe and exist in my brain and I can hear them talking uh, and, and I know what they would say next. That's when I just, I have this compulsion and need to write it. And so I do. And um, I started uh, writing in short form um, and I got my, my first job as a writer, as a staff writer for Disney and did that for mm, seven years and then uh, moved on to toys but I was still screenwriting the whole time I mean it was just you know it would come and go and everything and then the recession hit and uh, I put everything on the back burner just to make ends meet and then as soon as the recession was done I jumped back into it and I said you know what what the heck I'm gonna go ahead and take my best work and I'm gonna throw it out there and see what happens or see what sticks and this one stuck <laughs> Cool. So this is something that you've been gradually working up, like kind of building as a muscle over the years. It's not something that you just kind of fell into. Yeah, I, I, I've been writing for years and years and years. That's not, I, I don't want to say that if you want to succeed as a writer, you must write for two decades before <laughs> you will succeed. That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, most of what I was writing was nothing like a Christmas cheer. And I just heard it in my head. And I, I encourage any budding writer who is wanting to get something out there. If they if they do the same thing, if the same if they can hear their characters in their head and they get a story, they just got to get out and you know do the research on on the formatting and and how to write properly to where you know the first thing that decision makers will do is is put it down and you know they'll they'll, <laughs> they'll file it in the uh, circular file cabinet is what we call it you know the, <laughs> yeah. The, the waste paper basket if if it's not formatted properly if you can get that done and then you can tell your story properly then everybody's got the same chance uh, it's it's very true what they all say no matter how hard it may be the cream does rise to the top and people will see it that's good uh so speaking of the christmas cheer can you tell us really what inspired you to even write this in, like what made you think a sequel to one of the greatest uh, literary pieces of all time was something that had to be done. It, it's amazing. Well, well thank you. Um, <laughs> when I was in middle school, and I'm not going to tell you what year that was, uh, <laughs> my I had a teacher that I had for three years. Don't know why, but I did. She was, a, a, I think, the volleyball coach. And the week of Christmas, she always made sure on the last day of school for us to be able to watch the George C. Scott version of A Christmas Carol from 1984. And she just, every time it played, she said, I love it, my favorite movie, my favorite movie of all time. And when people say that, that's powerful to me. And so I listened as a kid, I listened, you know, and I, I, I fell into the story. And I guess it just encompassed Christmas, like the, the whole feeling of Christmas for me. And, you know, it, every, it, it stuck with me that at the end of the story, uh, and I, I've said this before <laughs> in countless places, it, it stuck with me that at the end of the story, Ebenezer Scrooge is trotting off merrily down the road into his own redemption. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and he enjoys all the benefits of it. And 
the one who made it all happen, Jacob Marley, is completely forgotten about and left to his own damnation. Exactly. I think that does resonate with a lot of readers. And and for any Charles re, uh, lovers out there or big, you know, lifetime fans, please forgive me for suggesting this, but if Charles Dickens ever left a plot hole in any story, it's he left, I, I, I always felt like he left Jacob Marley unresolved and I felt like, okay, well, since this story's been written, Marley's been waiting 175 years for someone to say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> and so I said, Someone's hey, got to speak minute. on his behalf. That's right. And so <laughs> I said, you know what? what? What would happen when Scrooge died? And, you know, would he be like, well, okay, I'm just going to go take my reward. So long, Jacob. You know, no, I don't think he would. And I was like, yeah, there's a story there. And I'll, I'll add this too. That story has been stuck in my head forever that he had to save Jacob somehow. And uh, I, about 10 years ago, it's, it, this, this story has been with me forever, but about 10 years ago, I tried to write it as a novel, mm. you know, you know and like Dickens did. And it did not work. I wrote about three to four chapters in and I was like bringing it in into the present and adding some new like lawyer dude. And it just, it wasn't singing to me, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, yes, you know, and I was having to type on it every single day or anything. Um, but with this, with this script, I did. I mean, it was like, okay, the story's just pouring out of me. And there's an expression in writing, you, you know, sometimes you have to murder your darlings. Oh, and yeah. I had to murder four chapters of my darling, to, you know, to, to be able to, to, to crank this this screenplay out. And so absolutely none of what you were intending for the novel made it into the script? There was one aspect and that was the kind of the, the legalese aspect of it, you know, mm. where Scrooge almost became Marley's A mini character. lawyer. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like, it became almost like an afterlife, um, uh, you know, court case. Mm. And, and there was that, but that was it. You know, all the other characters were, were, you know, I, I, I completely chucked them, so. Okay, uh, this is like more of a, per, uh, a personal side when I was reading this script. Did you intend for this to be a live action piece or an animated piece? I always, uh, and I'll tell you, every, every word I wrote was for the cast of the 1984 version of A Christmas Carol. I, I mean, Dorothy <laughs> wow. Scott is dead. Roger Rees is dead. Frank Finlay is dead, but I heard them speaking in my mind and, and I wrote for them um, at, for this, you know? And so, yeah, I always considered it live action. Could it be animated? Yes. Could it be translated to the stage? Yes. Uh, but my original, my original mm -hmm. interpretation is always live action. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, because it came from that origin that would uh, work with that. Um, but do, uh, my next question is, do you see yourself writing outside of other genres or are there any specific genres that you absolutely have to write for, absolutely will never touch or that sort of thing? Um, by the grace of God, I have an agent who is actually about to turn into a man, my personal manager. Um, and I say by the grace of God, because I my mentality with screenwriting is probably the exact opposite of what they look for, which is they want you to be inside a nice pretty little box and pick your genre, stick with it and write what you know. But the thing is, is that I think that you, you, you very quickly tap that market. And it also restricts you from, if you come up with a great story, you know, you're not supposed to write it because it's not in your genre. Um, if I, and, and, you know, if I'm, if I'm, you know, pinned to the floor with a gun to my head and saying, you got to pick a genre, then the closest I can come to is probably dark drama, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, and that's not really even a specific genre. That's just kind of the way I write. Um, but I mean, I've written, I've written comedy. I've written slasher horror. I've written family, um, sci-fi, uh, fantasy. It's, it's just, I, I, I feel like if I come up with a great story idea, I'm going to write it, you know, I'm at least going to write a treatment on it uh, mm -hmm. because I'm not going to say, well, no, that's not my genre and just pitch it. So, I mean, is there anything no. specific that you don't really have an interest into writing? Like any specific, <sighs> like you could, yeah, if you got the idea, but if you like, well, really, yeah. 
let me preface that mm -hmm. by saying if somebody wants to hire me for X genre script, I'm going to say yes, <laughs> even if it's on this list. But if I have a preference as to what I would rather not write, probably a romance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm. Uh, it's just, uh, it's. It, I don't know. It's. I, it doesn't sing to me as much as it does to some people. It's really people, hard to make a very good romance. It is. It really is. You know, like a like a rom. I mean, I could do a romantic comedy so long as it was heavy on the comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was a love element there. But I, I, mean, I guess it would be a, a comedic. Well, no, yeah, a romantic comedy rather than a comedic romance. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's I, that. That's really about it. You know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, not to sound like your mom or anything, but uh, what are your what are your future plans for this script? Like, what do you intend the future to be for Christmas cheer? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my favorite expressions is that man plans and God laughs. Oh yeah. Uh, so I can plan all I want, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. <laughs> but uh, if you want to know what I would like to see happen with it. Um, <sighs> You know, it's this is probably a mid to high budget script mm -hmm. because it would probably require a decent amount of CGI, as you probably deduced. <laughs> um, I mean, it's ghosts. It really is. And and it's I mean, unless you can figure out a way around that. Um, so I would love to see. And, and I know we're in the, the pandemic and mm -hmm. everything is going to streaming, but every writer i think dreams of their their day at their their movie premiere at the theater and mm -hmm. i i'd love to have that i don't have to have that but i would love to have that and uh i guess you know just to be able to to see it in the theaters or at least if nothing else just available to to get in a streaming format that would be the, i mean just just to get it made you know and, yeah. and a good quality version of it that would you know, that would be a, a check off my bucket list. Exactly. Um, do you like want to direct or choose casting, producing, or are you, are you satisfied with just like, I wrote this, go with God? Well, I think most, most um, as of yet unproduced writers are really mostly interested in just getting a sale, you know, and getting established. And I'm there too. But that being said, once that happens and things start expanding and I've got more opportunity to do more stuff because of my background, that may change. You know, I may get an opportunity to, you know, come on and, and produce something or direct something um, or, you know, have a little bit more involvement in it. And at the time, I, I can see myself being more interested in, in having a little more pull and say so in the stuff that I, I write. I don't want to necessarily become, you know, do... Quentin Tarantino type, you know, where he does everything, but, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it would be, it, I think it would be nice in the future to be able to, you know, make my own stuff. I, I've said this before, I, I grew up, you know, my, 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 my childhood screenwriting hero was John Hughes. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, just, just an amazing talent that was taken way too soon. I think he mm -hmm. had probably, you know, a good 20 more scripts left in him, um, but he was also a brilliant director you know, and I'd like the opportunity to see what kind of director I would make at some point. Yeah, I feel like everyone should give it a try at least. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any bits of advice for any new up and coming writers that are watching this interview? Yeah, um, if you if something's got to stick with you, then let it be. You cannot do this as a hobby. It, I mean, it, it you can, but the, unless you, you know, unless your uncle is Martin Scorsese or, you know, you, you uh, are related to or great friends with Adam Kohlbrenner or uh, some representative in the, in the industry or, you know, that's got a lot of pull. Um, it's, it's, you're not going to just be able to do it without throwing yourself into it. I mean, it's, it's got to be something that haunts you um, because otherwise, the attention is going to end up going to those it does if you don't. Um, so it's something that I thought about every single day. And, and, and it, I, I would not necessarily write pages every day, but I would uh, tweak something every day, or I would 
try to make a new connection every day, or I would research how to find another way to get noticed every day, you know, and, or, you know, I would talk to people in the industry every day. Um, and it was, it was, and just something, so, you know, I had to do something. Uh, I took the weekends off, but <laughs> I, just something toward it, something that made me take one baby step further toward it. You know, the old expression of the journey of a thousand miles mm -hmm. starts with one, the first step. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to keep taking steps. It's a long walk, but you know, some days you're going to take a step and uh, other days you're going to sprint, you know? So, mm -hmm. and some days you'll take steps backwards, but you know, you just got to get back up and start walking again. Got it. So avoid writer's block as much as you can. And I guess, Exercise. Yeah, it is kind of like an exercise with writing. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think we can finish off this interview with like one fun question. Um, so I know we're in COVID time. So I know a lot of people don't get to really be with their families or get to celebrate the same way they used to. But pre COVID, did you and your family have any sort of holiday traditions that you would do every year together? Uh. Yeah, um, and I, I, it's something I always looked forward to, um, and I don't know if we're going to continue it this year because my wife is a school teacher, and so she's on high alert for any possible infection point. You know, yeah, my or, sister's a middle school teacher too. Yeah, so I mean, if if she gets it, then she runs the risk of passing it on to you know twenty little people. You know, and then mm -hmm. they infect their families, so that's that's terrifying. Um, but we, uh, I mean, I've got four kids. <laughs> I've got a seven-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 23-year-old. Oh, those are fun uh, ages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so our family tradition was that we always, you know, we picked up my dad and we would all drive out to a nice little rustic area uh, in near where we live and go see Santa and spend the day, you know, shopping around. And then we would go have a nice dinner at an old rustic restaurant, you know, nearby near a fireplace. And that's just always been a great memory for me. So I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk her into it this year, but uh, I hope so. And if not, then, you know, Hey, like, it's like the motto of this year has been, there's always 2021. So thank goodness. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't end before that happens. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen in the next what uh, fifteen something days. I don't know math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's 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 hope that twenty twenty one starts off a lot better than twenty twenty did. Exactly. That's very yeah. Looking forward to it. Well, uh, thank you very much for doing this interview. Uh, on behalf of the Bull City International Film Festival, we loved a Christmas cheer, and we really hope to see a lot more of your work on the big screen. Well, so do I. <laughs> I really enjoyed the reading. That was that was very yeah. Uh, all the actors good. really loved it, and they were really happy that you were present for that. Oh well, good. Yeah, it was it was fun to do. All right. Well, I'll uh, conclude our interview here today. Uh, be sure to check out our uh, festival that's coming up in March. Bye.